Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Distinguished Lecture Program on February Texas Blackouts and Grid Reliability by Dr. Jessica Bion. Uh, my name is Arash Bayramband. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate in electrical engineering at University College Dublin. I'm also currently the chair of IEEE PES UCD student branch chapter. Just quick notes about this uh, program. Please keep your microphones uh, muted during the session and use the chat box uh, for questions. So we will have a Q&A session uh, at the end of the lecture. So you may ask your question by popping those in the chat box. Also for your attention, the audio and presentations will be recorded and later published on the organizing uh, committee's websites and YouTube channel. And the last point is that chat history will not be uh, recorded. <coughs> Firstly, I would like to invite Professor Andrew King, the director of the Energy Institute at University College Dublin to add his words of uh, welcome, and then I'll be with you. Professor King, please. Thank you, Arash, um, and I won't keep everyone very long. I just wanted to, to welcome everyone to, to thank Arash, the Committee of Dublin, and indeed our, our friends at University of Manchester for organizing such an exciting talk and, and topic. Um, I think we are all, interested and concerned observers at the events in the Texas blackout. Uh, and also I was most concerned looking at all the varying degrees of misinformation, at least to an extent in, in the media. So really looking forward to hearing um, from uh, Dr. Bian in terms of a, an informed perspective to cut through what is obviously a very complex and complicated issue as, as I think we all will appreciate uh, grids and power grids are. Uh, and just from a side point in terms of Dublin, we're just reactivated our student chapter branch. We've had it running for some years and it kind of fell into abeyance. So I really want to thank Arash and his colleagues on the committee for reactivating it. Uh, and this is not the first event we've had back, but one of the early ones. And what better one to have than a distinguished lecturer program event with the president elect of the Power and Energy Society addressing it. So I can't think of a, a better topic and a better event. So I really just want to pay tribute to the student volunteers who as we all know, drive so much of the activity of the local chapters and branches in universities around the world. Um, and of course, I want to thank Dr. Bian for joining us uh, and really looking forward to the talk. So that's really all I wanted to say, just to welcome everyone and to thank you all for, for the organization. I'm really looking forward to the talk. So I will hand back to you, Arash. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Keane. Uh, so please let me give you a quick update on the UCD student brand chapter. As Professor King mentioned, uh, this student chapter has been inactive for the past few years, and recently we decided to revive everything. We would like to thank Professor Andrew King, the director of the Energy Institute at UCD, and my good friend Lee, the vice chair of the student activities in the UK and Ireland section, and also the student chapter at the University of Manchester for all of their supports in this regard. Uh, we restarted our activities in this new chapter last month by hosting a webinar about data visualization for power grids. And as you can see currently, this uh, student chapter has three members. Uh, I myself, my good friends, Mohamed Afkusi, the vice chair, and Federico, the secretary. Uh, now I'm going to ask my good friend Kiai from the University of Manchester to add his uh, points about the SBC at that university, and then I'll be with you again. Thank so, you, Arosh. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Ke Yi Wang, and uh, I'm currently chairing the IEEE PES student branch chapter at the University of Manchester. Uh, we are uh, a student uh, committee based within the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering at the University of Manchester. Uh, we were formed in 2012, and uh, we had has had over uh, 100 student members uh, till now, and uh, uh, we are one of the most uh, active and best performing student branch uh, in the UK, UK and uh, Ireland uh, region. And this can be reflected from our uh, past achievements and awards. So uh, uh, you can see our channels of website, emails, and, uh, and uh, some social medias. And Arash, please, next slides. So uh, these are uh, the uh, current members of the committee. We have 
eight uh, members, active members, who are PhD students and undergrad students. And uh, our academic advisor is Robin Priest. Uh, and Dr. Robin Priest is also with us today. And uh, I also want to give one word about uh, uh, Jessica's uh, history with uh, Manchester because she delivered a DLP lecture in 2019 uh, on regulatory aspects of implementing advanced technology. And she also gave a talk this year with Manchester about Women in Power Initiative during the past day webinar. So uh, we really uh, appreciate uh, Jessica's efforts. And uh, this is our honor to host her again to give this webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kia. Uh, so joined you with the student chapter at the University of uh, Manchester. It is our great pleasure to welcome Dr. Jessica Bian as our uh, today's speaker. Dr. Jessica Bian is the president-elect of the Aitrikali Power and Energy Society. She is a visionary leader and architect, has spearheaded electric industry and reliability metrics, and grid uh, risk assessment. Currently, she is the vice president of grid services at GridX Partners. Before that, uh, she was with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And previously, she was the director of performance analysis at North American Electric Reliability Corporation, NERC, in Atalanta, Georgia. Under her leadership, a total of 18 industry-wide reliability indicators were established to determine uh, grid reliability, adequacy, and associated risks. She is widely recognized as a pioneer and trusted world leader in the field. Uh, she earned her bachelor degree in, in electrical engineering from Taiwan University of Technology, China, master of science from the Electric Power Research Institute, Beijing, China, and PhD from Tulane University, New Orleans, Louisiana, USA. She was also the PS secretary for from 2016 to 2019. So thank you very much. Uh, please follow uh, both student brand chapters at University College Dublin and also the University of Manchester at these addresses. And please do not hesitate to contact us in, if you have any questions. So uh, now I would like to hand it over to Dr. Jessica Bion. So Dr. Bion, uh, whenever you are ready, you may start. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arash. Uh, this is a very uh, warm introduction. And I hope you are having a great summer. And, and here, this is the last week of the summer. So um, enjoy. And I, I appreciate uh, you having me here. And, and thank you and uh, Kai for organizing this particular event and uh, hum me down for all the, the information. And also wanted to um, thank Robin and Professor King for your advice and support. Um, this is the exciting time for all of us. And uh, if, if we look at um, all the studies, all the electrification, right, all the trends that we have, um, at least here in, in the United States, we expect by 2050, our demand, our load will double and our transmission system will triple. Uh, just think about the change in transformation uh, to our infrastructure, particularly to the grid transmission and distribution. And, and you'll see, and also this is it's like a key, we're also getting all the great edge technologies, AIs, machine learning and robots, sensors, millions uh, and sensors into our grid. So you all uh, would take this into the future. So you, you are future, so I'm excited to share uh, what I know with you so that uh, we don't have to see um, this type of event like the, the Texas one. But again, this is a, a very um, a, um, sad and, and tragic event. Uh, at least we know 200 people died because this particular event. So now I'm gonna share my screen. 
Okay, so I'll, um, if you have any questions, please um, enter the chat. I'll try to answer it towards the end. All right, so let me go to my uh, slides. Can you see it now? Yes, I can. Thank you, Kay. So let me do, all right. So here's a, um, the topic. I have several topics, and this is the topic um, Harash and Kay picked up. So I think this is very timely. So I will go through the events quickly and also talk about the causes and then the possible solutions and some, because I worked as a regulator. Uh, of course, I started with my uh, career as an engineer, um, as you all, I studied um, bachelor degree and I got my PhD all in electrical um, engineering. And then I joined Westinghouse Electric and there I um, worked on um, the flexible AC transmission technology or fax. And so I, I kind of know the, 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 the inverter-based technology, right, in transmission and distribution. This is, this is booming right now. If you look at um, the worldwide inverter-based manufacturer and their stocks are booming. So again, this, this indicates our industry is transforming into a, a, a more less inertia and more, um, I would say many, many stakeholders and players that are coming into, into our traditional grid. So this is the exciting time. So let me share um, this particular story with you. Before I start, because um, like I said, I was a regulator. So we like to use this as a um, disclaimer. So the viewers, um, the, the views ex expressed here are only mine. It does not reflect PES or any other, um, like my, my company. And some of the, um, and also there's the, um, a, the Federal Regulatory Commission, Energy Regulatory Commission and other um, entities here, they're doing the official investigation. So hopefully the reports will come official um, root cause analysis will come out uh, later this year. So that's why I'm saying here's the events data and graphs are still in early stage. It's not, it's published by the grid operator, the data that I have. Uh, it could, they could tweak a little bit. Um, so we'll, we'll see that by the end of the year. So this is what happened um, in February, particularly the three days, 15th to 17th. And February 14th, you all know, it's the um, Valentine's Day is here. Um, so it was a Sunday and the forecast that it's gonna be cold. And then Texas folks that, especially the, the great operator, expect they will, they will hit, hit the historic high uh, winter cold events. So the load wise, they, are, they expect it to hit the, the record um, by Sunday um, by, let's see. Okay, so by, um, by Sunday evening. And um, amazingly, they were able to meet that demand. ERCOT is, is the great operator. And I worked there for, for about um, five years in uh, 1997. Uh, let's see, 1995, uh, four, 1993 to 1997. So I was there. So I, I kind of know the, the history, the origin. So I'm glad you, you picked this topic because um, I, like I said, I work in that great operator um, place for, uh, for a while. So I know the culture, the history, uh, the politics, of course, the I, I was trained um, in, uh, in, in particular science and technology engineering side. So I, of course, I know how to run the system, how to look at the power flow dynamics and the ERCA at the time, they, start, they started market, uh, energy market, wholesale market as well. So I, I was there, I, I know the market rules. So now fast forward now to, uh, to this year, 
the, the February, like I said, Sunday was Valentine's Day, and this is the traditional kind of a, um, a, a day that we gather together, and, and also texts expect to, to have a cold uh, evening. So, like I said, amazingly, they were able to meet the, that particular record high without shedding any load. So I, I'm, I assume that uh, they, they probably all had a big relief and without thinking, I mean, the nightmare actually was coming uh, soon, at, 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 right after midnight. Um, and and this this picture um, I just want to show this is not just the Texas. Um, in in 2012, I I uh, live along the, the East Coast, and we had a super storm Sandy. Same thing. My house was without electricity for seven days. That was in October. So it's not like a Texas could have an extreme weather event and uh, everywhere in the world could have the, the same event. The, the question is why we got to, um, to see that, that tragic result. So here's the, um, what happened after Sandy in, in October 2012. You can see here's New York City and people using um, the diesel generators. Uh, the folks here tried to charge their phone using the bike or they went to the pizza place uh, on the street and try to charge the phone. It was uh, chaotic. Like I said, my house was without electricity for seven days. So because this topic that I have is, is between um, the Texas event and reliability. So I'm gonna touch reliability a little bit. And how do we define what's the official way or the legal uh, language for reliability here in the United States? And you know that reliability has as many um, parameters or variables around it. So we have resources, generators, transmission, distribution, and uh, we also have a weather, uh, do the forecast. Now we have the, the new renewable um, energy, all that, all those, and plus culture and, uh, and, and politics and laws, they're all part of this reliability equation. Okay, so we know that um, the, the first power plant um, was built about 130 years ago. At the time, the, the power plant was built close to low center, like New York City, Chicago, um, London, all those places where the lows are. But as we, as the industry grew, as uh, people see the electricity was a, such a wonderful, um, wonderful thing to have. So they started trying, you can't build every power plant, right? In um, every neighborhood, they start to connect. And the reason we're doing that is a cost effectiveness and reliability and safety. By connecting together, we're helping each other and also bring the, 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 the cost down. So these are the, the four giants, they kind of came uh, we all know Thomas Edison and Westinghouse and then uh, Tesla came with the AC. And then this guy, Samuel Insall, I just wanted to um, kind of give a, a brief story on it. So like I said, at the time, um, the electricity was very expensive. So um, only stockbroker in New York City could buy the electricity. Uh, most people, it was just um, unreachable. So Samuel Insall saw this. Um, he worked with um, um, Thomas Edison for a while, and he um, and he know the Thomas Edison's company was about to go bankrupt. So he just felt um, it was just not right, right? Such a good thing, and uh, the company could not make any money. So he moved to Chicago and formed and started his own company. Uh, it's called Commonwealth Edison Chicago. So he started that company and uh, he said, maybe I, I should have a new different business model. So um, one time, here's a story says, he went actually back to London and he saw um, there's a stamp, like um, when you go to post office where you put a stamp on your letter, you mail it's a flat rate. It goes 
the same rate goes to the entire country. So he got the similar idea. He said, maybe that's what I should do is I have the same rate to all the customers uh, and also make that affordable. Then I'll charge on top of that, maybe let's say 10%, I'll make a profit, but it's a guaranteed profit. So he went back to Chicago and talked to the city um, government and the government said, yeah, sounds like a great idea. Let's just try it. So from that time, that stamp rate, um, the business model has become a traditional or standard business model until today. So if you look at your electricity bill, yeah, some, some of most of them are deregulated. You'll see um, the generator, uh, right? The, the energy and the transmission delivery and distribution delivery. These three like main chargers, maybe some of them they have renewable uh, surcharge as well. So those are the ones, but it's a flat. And, uh, um, and, and if you look at in detail, fine prints, you'll see on peak and off peak rates. And those are kind of refined and uh, uh, adjusted later on. But at that time, Samuel Insel said, uh, I will build the power plant and get them connected so that everyone, every household, um, they, they can afford and also they can enjoy this, this wonderful um, service. So he did that. And so he went out and borrowed all the money and built it and then, and then collect extra 10% um, around it, collect that extra percent that that was his guaranteed return. So he made so, I mean, yeah, the, the, the capital, in, in the, the investment was in, intensive, but he was able to get them recovered and pay, pay them off plus interest and still make money. So if you look at the traditional utility, let's, let's say your national grid or uh, my local company here, and they are doing the same thing. So this is very important to understand without knowing this, and it will be very hard to explain what happened in Texas, okay? Explain what's going on. So again, the utility, their model is based on the capital investments. Let's say I have this distributed energy resources, right? So we have the DERs, we have AIs, we have so many wonderful um, technologies, right? You guys are PhD students and want to have all kinds of control theory, right? And how to, modernize the grid and make it more advanced. However, when you talk to utility and not that enthusiastic say, hey, yeah, let's, let's try this, let's try that. Because um, the incentive is just not there. Their incentive is, is put more money, more capital money so they can get more return. Okay, uh, at least in, in, the, you, in, in the States uh, and most of the, the world is the same thing. Let's say I, um, I put the AIs into it. I hire a five PhD, right, to use that engine and run it. Whatever the cost, the utility hire the PhD students and buy a new software, EMS, data an analytics, and all those things, and they don't get any penny or they do not get any revenue or they do not um, earn anything extra. So let's say they spend $100 million to hire people to do maintenance work at switch yard, at substation, buy uh, relays, uh, transformers, everything. And they just get that $100 million back from ratepayers, no 10%. So their incentive is, is to build and build. They, they go out and, and get the capital and then uh, the business model the regulators and, and gave them the guarantee. It's like the Chicago government guaranteed Samuel Insel that percentage return because he can go out and, and collect that money from every household, from every, um, every person who has been using electricity service. So this is a very important concept. Like I said, when I started my um, engineering work, design and writing, the IEEE papers, I didn't have that concept. I said, why I, right? I said the best paper, best patent and ever had and, and nobody wants to use it. So there's that you can understand now, there's no incentive for them to actively seeking the new technologies and put it in because 
uh, at the management's mind, it's not adding any earnings in return to their book. Okay, so this is very important, but it started in Samuel Insel. So 130 years later, we're still using that business model. Okay, I'm not saying it's wrong or um, this is the right business model. I'm just saying this is, this is how we um, got to where we are today. All right, so um, let's, let's look at some of the, the big events in, in the USA. 1965, we had a huge Northeast blackout, including New York City. So because of that, um, so the country started a volunteer organization called National Electric Reliability Council, or NERC, and says, oh, okay, let's industry talk, talk it through, let's come up with some best practices or volunteer policies and see if we can follow that so that we can avoid blackout. Unfortunately, 1977, another one, um, another New York City, big, huge blackout occurred. So then in 2002, just, just think how many years it took, 2002, and this organization, um, they said, okay, some of the policies, voluntary standards, like N minus one, we all know N minus one, right? Uh, this is like black stars and all those standards became mandatory and enforceable in Canada because that event actually brought um, the, 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 the city of Toronto down as well. So that's why Canada started the first. And in the States, they still didn't want to do anything. It was still voluntary standards. Not until 2003, we had another historic blackout, including New York City, Canadian folks, um, uh, lots of lots of um, yeah, folks. You probably heard that it started with a tree trimming, right? The tree was not trimmed, um, was not trimmed on time. And plus uh, the operators, um, the state estimated tool, the situation awareness tool alarm was not working correctly and then plus really uh, malfunctions. So those are the three big um, contributors to the 2003. So the regulator had enough says, okay, you guys, we gave you uh, the free pass to some, um, 1965 and 77, and you just cannot uh, discipline yourself, give an, an, another a huge blackout. So what they did, they came up, um, with a, a law says you guys have to um, to follow the mandatory standards, cut the trees, and we have to check your M minus one planning. We have to look at your operation, emergency preparedness, situation, all kinds of standards. So um, in 2005, three years after, and the U.S. regulators, um, they came up with a law called Energy Policy Act of 2005, and they want to create this ERO, this ERO, Electric Reliability Organization. So this all, just the reason I'm giving you this has nothing to do with engineering, you can tell, right, from just reading that. It's, it's not um, because that we didn't have the right equation or we didn't do our analysis right. So these are the lawyers, they are, they're making these policy changes. So they said, okay, so all the US, um, we call users, operators, and owners, they have to follow certain standards, mandatory. If they do not follow that, um, this organization, this ERO can write a ticket, a penalty, up to a million dollars per day for each violation. So it's, it's very hefty the hefty uh, fine. So, so now, now we know that brings back to um, a, uh, my reliability definition. So here in the, in the US, it's the lawyers, this is in the law books. If you look at the law, so every standards, everything that, that we built, if you look at our electricity bills based on this legal definition, um, lawyers use like to use a, a words, right? The engineers, we like use numbers. Economists like use dollar signs or pound sign. So uh, the law, because the lawyer, um, they put into the law in 2005, here's how they define. It's called adequate level reliability. Um, adequate level, you can understand they, they're meaning a lot, like N minus one, the voltage within, 
the range, frequency has to stay right, relatively constant, all that. But they don't, because they're lawyers, they don't say the, those engineering words. So here's what they said. They said, if the system is running without instability, uncontrolled separation, or cascading failures, we say the system has adequate level of reliability, meaning that you utility guys can start to bill the customers so you can get the return. If you can operate your system, plan your system so that we don't have instability, uncontrolled separation, or cascading outages or blackouts, then go out and, and set a rate. And like, like I said, like a stamp rate, set a rate and you can get your guaranteed return, mostly 10% here in, in the States. So only three evils, just remember that. Here, this is how we define reliability. Pretty simple, instability, uncontrolled separation, and cascading failures. And now let's go through the, the, um, the Texas event, just so that we can see, did that event, um, was that event unstable? Did that event was uncontrolled separation or that event has a cascading failures? If none of these conditions occurred, then we say Texas system was reliable in February, especially those three days. You can type your chat, type your um, comments that do you agree with that or not. But according to this legal definition, Texas, during those three days, during that week, did not go unstable, did not have any uncontrolled separation, right? And didn't go, um, didn't have the cascading failures. They had a controlled blackout, controlled um, separation. That's all. So it's not in this definition, meaning the Texas um, a grid at the time was reliable. Yet millions of people right, without power and more than 200 people died. But we still say, according to this legal definition, Texas system was reliable. So Professor King said there are a lot of misinformations, but like he said, according to the law book, according to um, the policymakers, or um, according to the, the Texas government, and that's what they're going to say because here's the legal definition. So I'm going to skip this. This is further. Now we come to the engineering part. After we saw those three evils, how do we how do we do it? And we can't just use those three right, three phrases when we operator uh, when we operate and plan our system. So what we did, what engineering um, community did is we kind of turned those three words into these seven um, more refined engineering terms. For instance, like B as frequencies maintained, voltage is maintained, um, the adverse reliability impacts really three and restoration, transmission N minus one and resources has to be adequate. So all that we are familiar terms, right? But they all started with that legal definition. And uh, I highlighted this, uh, this particular one in that. This is where the Texas event fits. It's adverse reliability. For instance, we, we call the low probability disturbance because it was extreme weather events like hurricanes and all that. And just, just say these events, all reliability standards says they all they need is manage that event. They didn't say uh, they cannot shed so many customers. They can. It's within their their um, authority as long as they manage it. So it's, the manage is a very flexible word. Again, they try to not to get into themselves into the corner. Just that managed. So and if you think about how Texas great operator or ERCOT manage the entire event, did they manage well, right? I mean, just ask, ask these questions in your mind. And if you were in charge, if you were Texas governor or CEO of ERCOT, 
what would you do? Would you think you manage that event pretty well? With all the engineering background you have, with all the things you learn at school or in the society, how do you manage that particular event? Okay, so I another um, I wanted to emphasize this again. If we try to understand Texas events or any uh, events within our industry or the industry, we have to look at history. I started with Thomas Edison, right? How we started the race. Um, and because, and you can see the Thomas Edison science and technology started first, then the business strategy, business model, the stamp rate, then law and courts. Now we have blackouts. So the consumers and customer, they go to the court and sue these, um, these companies like Pacific Gas Electric here in California, right? They didn't do the maintenance right. They caused the wildfire. And so they, um, the customers sued them. So this is all part of the rates, part of how we build our system, how we plan our system. Then regulatory policy as the after blackout, mandatory standards and politics. Um, so I have a, I have, I can give you tons of tons of example on how, how politics impact and you'll see that later as well. The culture. So one of the, the you hear a lot, why Texas was kind of standalone, why they don't want to connect with uh, the west part of the um, the country or east part of the country because the culture they wanted to um, be on their own they don't want to have any government or federal government to intervene uh, what they do so all that could explain what happened in texas so it's not just um that because of the cold weather all these impact who they are today how they build their system why they failed Okay, so here's uh, the picture of how the North America grid um, look like. So we have four grids and they all tied through the HVDC. So they run their own like AC thing. Uh, so we have West interconnection, West of Rocky Mountains. And here's where uh, we had a trouble in February, Texas interconnection. And they had, um, they have DC ties get into the eastern connection. Here's a Quebec. And you probably know why Quebec is the same thing as, as, as Texans. They do not want to connect with the rest of the, the Canada. Uh, so they said, okay, yeah, I have some HVDC, but I want to be my own boss. So they decided to um, form their own grid. So, so that's why we have four um, connections in North America. So here's a British Columbia, Canada, here's Ontario. So they are connected as part of the West system and, uh, um, and then the other, like I said, Toronto and others, they're connected with the USA as part of the East interconnection, except Quebec and Texas. Just think about the culture, how they play the role, why we have four grids instead of one or two. And they are very small compared with these two giant uh, interconnections, but they still decided to um, go their own way. Here's the uh, energy markets. You probably wanted to know how the markets did and all that. So the Texas has its own energy market. Um, and then we have California and for PJM, I worked at PJM for a while. There's, uh, there's some big, um, the markets here. So here's, uh, um, and I said earlier that the, uh, here, one of the reliability standards said that the grid operator, they have to, or planning authority, they have to plan their system. They have at least have 15% reserve margin. Meaning that if I, uh, my load is uh, 100, let's say 100, and at the standards, the reference says we like to have we like to see your resources 115, um, let's say megawatts or, or percent, so that they know that you have enough. Um, so this is what going to the winter time, the Texas uh, in um, October and told the world says we we expect we would have a tight winter. And, and the, here's their winter anticipated all the, the capacity resources here. 
and they also consider typical maintenance outage and then typical forced outage, all of these are generator data. And then look at this extreme condition. They actually predicted and said, well, maybe we probably would have some extreme conditions. Then we have less generators. And then other capacity risk adjustments, anything others. So, uh, and operational mitigation. Um, so they could have some black, I mean, some units they can call, they can reliability must run units and add those. So all together, and they said, we can cover 67 gigawatts, right? Under the extreme winter peak condition. And normal, yeah, of course, we don't have any problem because they are expecting 82 gigawatts. And with all the outages and everything, uncertainty, extreme weather, they said we can cover 67 under extreme weather conditions without these um, forced outages and, and others. Okay, 67, right? So going to the winter, they, they prepared. So let's look at um, the weather. So here's the weather, like I said, uh, it's a Monday, and this is the, the, uh, the Valentine's Day. You can see the weather actually gets colder. And this is a Dallas, um, city of Dallas, the, uh, the forecast, or and actually as well. And, and you can see actually went um, to 10, those are the uh, Fahrenheit. The coldest wet weather, this is the third worst winter storm in 130 years um, in terms of the span, geographic severity and duration. And the coldest was in uh, 1899. So Texas normal weather, Dallas normal weather is 61 high and 41 in February. But look, just look at the weather. Um, it was 10, it's around 10 to compare with, with 41 at midnight. And snow, very rare, but it's possible. Okay, so that's what the weather looked like. So here's the, the chart from grid operator, ERCOT. And, and you, can, you can see this is the, on the Monday morning. Like I said, Valentine's Day, they cover the 67 megawatts, I said earlier, without any issues. They hit the record, they're pretty excited that they did it. However, when we got into the, the midnight, um, the Monday midnight, they, they saw that uh, the, the generation start to trip line because the freeze, cold freeze started to come in. So a bunch of generators, like gas generators just couldn't hold into that cold weather, it started tripping on. So uh, ERCOT issued emergency alert called EEA-3. They said, okay, please shed 1000 megawatts. They order right here. So you can see the frequency went up a little bit, right? And they said, okay, yeah, the worst is over. Right? And they felt pretty good. And uh, not, this is 1.23 AM. So um, 20 minutes later, and they see about 1400 megawatt generation tripped offline. Right? And then they see more generation trip offline. And so that's why you see the frequency start to dip in fast. So without additional choice, they, they had to order to shed additional 1000 megawatts right here. Unfortunately, right after that frequency, I mean, continued to dip. And uh, everybody tried to explain why, right? We shed 1000 megawatts and we, we see, we should see something like this bounce back a little bit, but no, continue to drop. And I'm sure the, the official uh, government report will, will say more, but I, I think ERCOT says, um, yeah, because some of the, the relays again, Right, we trip some units and their frequency start to drop if the relay is not setting correctly and it causes other units to trip. This is initial um, the analysis says that, like I said, we'll wait for the official report. So it drops off and then it, it almost got to the critical point, which is they have to shed load. Um, so there's ender we called um, U, it's called load, um, it's called UFLS, 
standard frequency load shedding is automatically to shed those loads. So before the ERCA says, I cannot get to that point um, because it will be very hard for them to come back after they hit 59.3. So there they ordered additional 3000 megawatts. And then they see frequencies start to come back. So that's how, so there are lots of theories, explanations why um, from here to there, and the units start to drop because that's not supposed to, I mean, according to design, right? I should, the, the frequency should come back, but that's not what we saw. So for the engineers out there and please, and pay a lot of attention to this, like you, you could have a great solutions for, for those. And those are the opportunities for us to dive into it. Fuel, um, I, have, I will go through this quickly. The fuel and, and, and 40, 40, close to half of the generation were out, okay, because um, the cold weather. And transmission distribution and load um, shed up to 72 hours, many feeders not rotating. So when they receive the order from the great operators that shed load, um, they shed everything they could. If they want to keep continuing, they're going to hit the critical load, like hospitals, and some of the water plants, they find out they should be on the critical, um, the load feeders, but it was not. Uh, so it was like a, a, a chaotic uh, situation. Uh, a lot of them, the, the critical load are not design, designated correctly. That's why you, you heard from news that um, many water treatment plant was not functioning well. And smart meters, they're not smart because they cannot do the rotation. Once you're out a shed, you stay offline for up to 72 hours. And here's another um, picture was posted online. And you can see this is at Austin downtown, Texas capital. Okay, Austin downtown, commercial buildings and uh, state capital. These are the residential area. And, and you would think that during the night, who needs lights? Who needs electricity in these commercial buildings? Yet we see them as, as defined as a critical load and these residential areas where they need the heat, they need the electricity to warm the house, to warm the, their bed and, and without electricity. So there are lots of issues here as well. Demand, demand side, well, people could say, yeah, what happened to demand side? They could share the industry load, commercial load, right? Yes. However, Texas has a rule says uh, emergency response service has to, has to be uh, capped at $50 million. The reason they did that is that if I have, let's say if I have $100 million, that means during the emergency, I would not rely on the generator. I would just shed the load, right? I would just rely on demand to go offline to keep, keep lights on. But the Texas has a strong industry lobby group, and they said, no, you cannot have infinite or very big load um, response program because we want to come into the market, make money, okay? which is the price could go higher because there is a wholesale market there. So the regulator agreed. So the, um, the compromised dollar, um, the, the cap is 50 million. So it's, it's, there's not much. 50 million, but it worked. It, so during that week, it worked. Um, and a lot of, you probably heard from news, a lot of um, the customer, around 40,000 customer, they are variable rate. Um, and they they were charged $1,000 for those um, three days. The markets, um, we all know the market is running the, um, based on op optimization engine. Um, so it tried to minimize the cost and then do the emergency and they can set up the cap. The cap um, in Texas regulation, cap could go to 9,000 megawatts. Again, I told you there's a $50 million here for the load right response and there's a cap for um, the generators and they they can receive the um, the the offer they can receive the the uh, the marginal cost up to nine thousand megawatt hours which is high like PJM like other markets about one thousand but ERCOT 
they're on their own uh, regulation up to 9,000. But um, for, for whatever reason, and during that night, and it didn't go to 9,000, only went to 1,200. So there's a bug, there's a flaw in, in that um, the software. So, the, so it's not asking the generator to come online because the generator says only 1,200. I assume you still have generators, right? So they, they're not, some of them, they just, they want to see 9,000, but they just don't because those are very expensive units to run, but the system is not giving them the, the 9,000. So ERCA contact PU, Texas Public Utility, the regulators. And so the, the regulators issued emergency order and manually set the energy clean price at 9,000 megawatts for three days. And so that actually four days, the three and a half, but um, so total the, the cost they spent by um, those energy within those four days, is about $45 billion. That is one third of Texas entire energy cost within a year, within a normal year. Just think about that. Those four days, they spent one third of entire um, money to buy energy. Just that dramatic event. So of course they had to charge a consumer, right? So Texas also was a billing agent in, in um, I mean, ERCOT is also the billing agent for, uh, for those companies. So they, a week later, they send a bill, said, well, because you, you bought these energy from wholesale price at 9,000 megawatts for four days, and we're going to charge you uh, $1.8 billion, the bill, to Brazil. This is just a regular co-op, like rural countries. They, they said, okay, we can't pay for it. I'm going to file bankrupt. Um, so, so these are the and city of Denta. I just want to give you some of the example is how dramatic the, the impact um, they touched so many people's lives um, and, and uh, not just the, the regular consumers and also cooperations, rural uh, cooperations and plus cities. And so, so many lawsuits filed. And the regular, who are regulators, right? You heard regulars a lot. It's, it's a very complicated in Texas. They have public PUC and they also have a Texas uh, Railroad Commission. And some of the bright spots, you can hear um, the, this is the, the one at the, in Houston, some of the, the household, they have the, the solar panels and they were able to um, get, and also have a storage, they have a battery storage and they kept their house running for more than 50 hours. And then also microgrid, it worked well. This is one of the microgrid in, in uh, Austin, uh, city of Austin. So it worked pretty well, provided total 60 megawatts over three and a half days. And I, I'm not going to go through this, but this is not the only extreme events we had. We have so many other um, extreme events. In them. So many solutions discussed, Store, more storage, uh, more engineering work on the distribution, how to sectionalize so we can rotate instead of just 72 hours and, and connect the ERCA with Eastern interconnection and all those, we talk about that. And, and but what happened actually in June uh, this year, the Texas governor signed the bill into the law and covered oversight, accountability, communication failures and weather Authorization. So these are the three. They are the main root causes of the Texas event. So Texas lawmaker realized that and they made a change. So like I said, they also came up with a fine, a million dollars, and they also came up with a standards to winterize the, the, um, the plants. So I won't go through this. You, you, you can have the slides and read all the details. So the reason I list all that is that you can see this is the grid is not just an engineering uh, design has so many players come into it regulators because it's capital incentive industry. So we have um, a this industry is heavily, heavily regulated. What about the future grid, right? We dream all resilient, flexible and all that. And those are opportunities to, to all of us. So I encourage every, everyone um, 
just if you like to see what the future looks like and be uh, the change agent. And like Gandhi said, be the change that you wish to see in the world. So join, uh, join PES, join uh, student branch chapter, or women in power, or any other community organization that you think is going to help you to change the world and make a better place. Please do so. Um, and as you can see, how to keep lights on, what's reliability. There's so many factors. Academia, like you doing, university research, manufacturer, and generators, TND. Uh, market standards organization, regulatory end user, and, and startups, and all in all, we all need your help and get connected to uh, make this better place. I know I'm running over time, so thank you. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Jessica, for this very, very insightful and informative uh, lecture. Actually, it was very interesting for myself because uh, I'm working almost in the same area. And also uh, for myself, that unsuccessful uh, load shedding was a kind of weird thing. And I think it's a, it's an area of re uh, research. So uh, I think we have now like 10 minutes or so for the Q&A session. So in case that you have any questions, you may pop your questions uh, in the chat box. So I'm, uh, I'm assuming that Dr. Bion is uh, also seeing the chat box, and I think we have a couple of questions here. So uh, let's go for the, maybe the first point is uh, by Robin. Sounds like the definition might need to, might need an update then. So that's a point. Uh, and in the first question, if you want to add something here, you can go ahead. Yeah, is the first one, do you think the limited legal definition, is that the first one? Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Okay, is the motivation, uh, yes. I mean, who wants to pay more, right? Especially here in, in the States because electricity is cheap. Um, they, they range from six cents, the US cents to uh, 36 cents. In Hawaii uh, has uh, the most expensive electricity. is 36 cents per um, kilowatt hour. And uh, in say Georgia, in, in Texas, seven cents. So it's very, very cheap. Um, so it, it's just hard and you said, okay, I don't like N minus one. How about N minus two? How about I built extra units, right? To cover all the extreme weather uh, and winterize those plants. And uh, yes, we can do it. But I, I don't think the, the politicians are ready to do it. And here's why, because most politicians are appointed figures, right? So if all, all they through the election, they're appointed. So if they keep, I mean, increase the, the rates, those are the basic service that um, all customer or the, the voters wanted. So if we keep raising that and they probably won't in office for long. So nobody wants to see the increase like the water cost, your basic service cost, right? Um, but some consumers, I think because the, the climate change, others, and, and lots of consumers, they're changing their way. So the, whatever we're doing is not sustainable. So we wanted to have a better environment, even though we're going to pay a little bit higher. So that, that concept is, is evolving. So you see more on that. Um, yes. So the cost, like I said, when, you, when, when I show the, the, the Thomas Edison, that chart, the cost effectiveness, low cost, affordable, and reliability and safety. Those are the three things and defined who we are as an industry today. So those are still three things. Affordable is every utility, let's say I wanna get a lot of AIs, I won't hire a bunch of PhD, right? Advance my grid. But all those costs has to go through the regulator's desk and they, they prove the rates. They said, okay, yeah, next year you can increase one cent for each kilowatt hour, get, get the return. If they said no, you cannot raise. Yeah, they 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 like I said they don't have any incentive to hire additional PhDs or to do more uh, advanced technologies into the grid. That's why it's a traditional. It's kind of old, outdated uh, grid. Okay, thank you very much. And the next one is by Molly. Uh, do you think the limited legal definition for 
uh, definition of ALR is the motivation for the recent development of resilience definitions and metrics. Yes, yeah, I, I kind of explain that because the legal definition is, is from the lawyers. The reason uh, was from lawyers because like I said, all those Congress, they are elected officials. And, and if they change the definition, add resiliency, add um, the sustainability and everything into it, right? And minus two, all that. And who's gonna pay for it? Consumer, most of the consumer don't wanna pay for it. And so they're not going to vote for these politicians. And that's why they wanna keep the race low. And that's part of the, the goal. Like I said, when Thomas Edison or Samuel Insull started, cost is, is the main, the, main factor, affordable, reliable, and, and safety. These are the three key things and still remains today. Yep, thank you very much. And the next one is by Selma. Why were not the tripping of the generators considered as cascading outage? Were they tripped in a controlled manner? Uh, that's, that's a great uh, question. When we say, yeah, the lawyers from cascading outage meaning that the, the system starts separate, the load starts separate. And there, we, the load is controlled. Um, we call it controlled blackout or controlled outage. So I can take this feeder out and uh, manually or through the, the automatic switch, but not the load did not go, go on its own. The generator, we have trips all the time. Right, even during the normal days, um, you'll see hundreds, hundreds generator trip offline. We have that's why we built a 15% margin. We have 15% more generators always available as a reserve spinning and regulation frequency following all that, and to cover the load, to cover the uncertainty. So okay. yeah, the, so generator tripping <clears throat> is not considered as as the uncontrolled separation. Only load is considered as uh, as the unload separations. Because generator tripping very, happens all the time. Yeah, very, very good point. So uh, Irene is asking, I was wondering whether Dr. Bion could address the difference between adequacy and reliability. Okay, right. So reliability is a very broad term. Like you said, reliability, we could say, um, I, I know some of them, let's say you have Olympic game, right, in your city. And your reliability probably is N minus five. You don't want any, any like attack or any cyber thing, whatever, right? Um, so that it could be N minus five. So reliability is a very broad term. The adequate level, so if you talk to lawyers, right, if you go to court, you know that they like to use reasonable, right? Do I have a reasonable rationale? to support, what's your evidence? And adequate mean, meaning is that maybe 95% of the time that you have the electricity, the other five and extreme weather condition or under some other unpredictable condition that yeah, you can, that it, it, it's, it doesn't have to be covered hundred uh, percent. That's what adequate level is. But lawyers, they, they couldn't come up with the number. So that's why they picked the word called adequate. And then, and like I said, I have a one slide, the seven points that frequency has to be maintained uh, within 60 Hertz. Voltage has to be maintained plus and minus 5%. Those are the same thing. This is, that's how we define adequate. But if we just use a reliable uh, and it is too broad. Yeah, thank you very much. And I think we have time for the last one, if you agree. Uh, so, uh, there is a question by uh, P. Boyer. Is there a breakdown of the cascading generation loss by the energy source like natural gas, coal, or the RES? Yes, yes, and right. And 50%, uh, mostly is general because they're the big, big plants, the, the gas plants. Yeah, most of them, there's, I think I have a chart. If you look at my slide, there's a chart that shows wind, solar and cold and nuclear, even nuclear went down during that week and, uh, and gas, and gas was, was the culprit. So you see the Texas, um, they came up with the standards and mandate the gas plants to uh, winterize uh, during those months. Thanks a lot. I think 
it's time to wrap it up and uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, if you agree, we are going to take a photo, uh, if you agree, Dr. Bion. So I would like to ask my friend, Mohammad, uh, uh, to, uh, to take a screenshot. Uh, kindly, you may turn on your camera if you were going to uh, take part in this photo. So uh, maybe three, two, and one. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks, everybody, for your time. Thanks, Dr. Bion. It was a great pleasure to have you here. We hope to see you again. And uh, it was very useful for, for myself. I, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. And thanks, everybody. Hope to see you again. And goodbye. Bye. Bye. -bye. You too.